Hey. <laughs> Hi. George with Pavlicek Studios. I'm gonna make some uh, eggs today. It's, they're sort of like marbles, only they're just not quite as round, which is actually harder than you think. After you've been making marbles a long time, you're like, hey, uh, let's just make a marble shape, or this, take the marble and make it egg shaped. You know, when you're first starting out making marbles, they come out anything except spherical. You get a lot of eggs and a lot of uh, the discs and stuff. So, going backwards in the other direction, I guess it's not backwards if you were someone who made a lot of eggs. Anyway, for me, it's been kind of a learning curve, sort of an adventure. Um, I really, I like it though. I mean, I could probably spend a lot of time doing it. But I don't think, well, I don't know. It's fun. Let's start with that. All right, so my first go-to this year is always flowers. So I'm having a lot of fun with flowers this year. But there's just like so many designs you can do with the egg shape and so many ways you could orient the axis of the egg shape as opposed to like the axis of rotation or what else the design you're doing in there. And what I found is that uh, if I want a nice flower to show up, I tilt it so the egg is sideways. So when the egg is laying down in a natural position on the ground, you see the flower. Uh, and I've been trying to take some pictures I need some of that grass, that Easter basket grass that you get when you're a kid. That stuff would be cool to take pictures with. Um, I'm going to see if I can dig some up. I was out and about earlier today, but I'm, I've been so, you know, focused when you go out to the store. It's like, oh, do it, what you need to do, and get out. Not too much, you know, wandering around. But I wanted to wander around and get some of that stuff. I totally forgot. Anyway, maybe next week. I'll have a few more of the eggs laying around because I've been making them, you know, a few here and there. Anyway, sorry blabbing on. So for a flower, let's start with a big clear glass rod. I will flash the end of it. You see it's a cut end. Is it a cut end? No, that's a ground end. So there's going to be a lot of oxidation and impurities on the end when you get that point. I've got a variety of tiny threads already pulled, uh, pink, and some accent colors, and some other stuff. Let's pull a, a little string, uh, just because that's so fun, and it's a great, uh, great thing to watch and, and, and get yourself warmed up for making some glass. So I've got a lot of pink, um, I think I could use some more yellow for stamen and some more black. Let's do nice yellow. I'm going to start with two different colors of yellow, a mustard and a lemon, and I'm going to pull the stringer, and it'll give me a color somewhere in between those two, and we'll uh, change from one end to the other, because I'm only going to mix it partially, and sometimes you get like little streaks of one of the darker colors to the lighter, or one of the lighter to the darker, and that, I find that really adds to the, the realism of the flowers or the design that you're doing, rather than just having one solid color. Um, especially if you're doing um, what I like to call like fantasy blooms or fantasy wildlife, where you're not really trying to reproduce something exactly. You're trying to give the suggestion of it. Uh, and some might say that that's cartoony um, or um, maybe just like a thumbnail of, of what the real object is, but I, I think that that is, affords you a lot of opportunity to explore the different elements that make up that blossom or that shape without trying to reproduce it too exactly. There's certainly things you learn from reproducing things exactly too. Um, which I, I've spent a lot of time doing that. But I, you change over time, you know. Right now, that's my thing, to do the sort of the fantasy blooms and wildlife. I have spent, like, periods of weeks where I was just trying to make a daffodil, and 
I want to really look like daffodils. Or, um, you know, name your species. And I had spent many years doing that in stained glass, figuring out, you know, how do we alter the line to give depth to the shape as well as just having it be a flat, more cartoon look, which stained glass really is. Um, and so I think it translates in the way that you approach the boundaries between realism and representationalism when you're dealing with glass. You can certainly do both and try to do uh, one or the other, and I think by the way you merge several of those aspects is how your style is expressed. That might be pretty heavy for a marble demonstration, but I think it's fun to think about. So, I made out of that string I just pulled, somewhere between lemon and mustard, is this color about one millimeter, and I'll be using these for stamen. Sometimes if I make a flower, I'll go through quite a bit of this just by drawing the petals. Let's do a yellow flower today. So, I'm going to start flashing my big, clear rod, large diameter, and we'll get a gather going on that. I'm going to build the flower as normal, and then when we're just about done and we'd normally start really perfecting the sphericalness for a marble, we're going to go the other way and make it an egg. And that will be fun. And what, as an overview of that, normally when we shape a marble and try to make it spherical, we are going into the hemispherical marble molds like this. We're using one of the larger hemispheres first to sort of rough out the spherical shape. Then when it becomes very close to being a sphere, we're going to use one of the hemispheres that's smaller than the diameter of the marble, so we're just using the rim, and it's sitting above the mold itself. And we're spinning the marble in along the rim of that hemisphere, and as we spin it, we're changing the axis of rotation. And so we're taking the perfect circle of this mold and by rotating that circle around our would-be sphere, we are making at any point in a cross-section of that shape, that uh, circle will fit around it. And that moves the sphere towards being a perfect sphere. So I took a piece of glass off the end of this and it hissed as I put it in water, which I have next to me. I always have water on my bench to quench glass, hot glass, sharp glass, broken glass, goes in the water just to get it off so I don't, I'm not putting my hand in it, I'm not burning myself, it's not getting stuck to other things, which really, that would only happen for the split second after it came off. But still, having sharp things on your bench is... I don't like it. <laughs> Some people love big piles of stuff everywhere on their bench. I find that annoying. I want to be able to reach, grab what I want, see what I have available, and not have it layered, you know, deep on your bench. I've been places where I don't know if they even know what their bench top is made out of, and it's like, what is there? There's short pieces of rod everywhere. Um, you know, you drop something down there and you're going to lose it. You're never going to be able to get that back because there's stuff everywhere. And then when people go to clean their bench, they're throwing a lot of stuff away that could be used for other things. Anyway, so... <laughs> clean your bench! <laughs> now, you do it however you want. I like my bench a little on the tidy side. In fact, when I come and thinking about what I'm doing... I often will just put things, you know, move things around just for fun. Maybe that's like a little uh, OCD or something like that, but 
I'm not a believer in that messy work crunch, creative mind kind of thing. I think both ends of that spectrum are worthy creation venues. All right, there's my clear gather. And then my rod, it's nice and hot. I'm gonna squish it flat with gravity on the marble plate next to me. I'm gonna take the rod, upend it so it's perpendicular to the horizontal surface of my bench like this. I'm gonna flatten it like that. And then I'm gonna squish it flatter with this paddle. I'm not mushing it down really hard. I'm just pushing it down like maybe another 30% evenly. Because since I'm going to take the flower, draw it two-dimensionally, and then turn it inside out to get it to bloom up in towards the shaft of the rod. If I start with a more even disc, round, evenly flat, I'm going to get a better bloom. I don't always need the bloom to be symmetrical, perfect, or, uh, you know, the, the right cone shape and cross-section or anything like that. I'm okay. If it comes out too nice, I'm going to get back in there and turn it over to crank it so it doesn't look like it was shot out of a Play-Doh fun factory or something like that. I want it to look natural. Have that little off. Anyway, so here's my disc. Let's start the flower. Um, let's do yellow petals, and so we'll do a brown stain. Let's see, do I have any brown? I use this brown purple strand, and I'm going to just make some tiny dots on the stand, and a little circle. Inside the innermost portion of the disc. Let's get it over in there. there Different sizes, kind of in a circle. It's going to be the big one at the top. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and poke the big one up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to heat all those little stamen into the surface of the disc so it starts to melt in. I'll just give it a second. Merge into that surface by giving it some heat, and then as it cools, I'm going to take those two biggest dots and I'm just going to poke them in a little bit so they'll stick up farther. That's me sassing the glass. I can do what I want, but in a, in a non obvious way. Now, petals I'm going to do on this one are going to be dashes, like so, there's the first layer, let's do three concentric circle layers, Now I'm going to just melt all those petals that I made for basically like little slugs of glass, yellow glass, on my disc. And I'm melting them in a little bit. I'm melting them a little bit farther to make the tip of the, whoops, my whole disc cracked off my rod. So, get that back together. I'm going to straighten it out, fused it, put my, oh, that's fine, fixing stuff, are you going out for a jog? Yes I am, All right. it's cold and unpleasant, <laughs> I don't want to go, it's moist out there, you could drink beer and, I know, I'll keep you company, <laughs> yeah. All right, so look, I fixed it. That's great practice. 
<laughs> you know what when you uh, invest like 10 or 15 minutes in that but then you get like 30 seconds to save it if you can mm -hmm. after the first couple that you lose you're like I'm gonna fix this <laughs> <laughs> do it quickly and you know yeah. the ones you don't make are valuable lessons and the ones you do are triumphs all right so we've got that melted starting to melt those back in again That's the disadvantage of soft glass uh, building on a large diameter rod. A lot of times um, you can go ahead and switch off to a metal punty or metal handle, which is nice. All right, so now those are really melted in. I'm going to go and get them hot. And a few at a time, I'm going to poke in the center of the petal. So it starts blooming into the disc a little early. And when I say poke in here, I'm not going far. I don't want to break through that little piece of color. So I, I'm poking maybe a millimeter in there, not even. I'm just starting the shape of the petal. I'm not really making the petal a shape now. It's giving it the tip. You know, when you vary your speed and use different glass, you'll find out what works. Start someplace, someplace memorable to you. And then go from there, say, oh, I want more, I want less the next time. And for marbles, you don't, for soft glass anyway, you don't get a lot of chance to examine them when they're finished until they're out of the annealing oven the next day. So I will either keep track with a little note saying I started here and I went lower, 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 or I started here and I went higher, higher, higher on the thing, and I know where I placed them in the kiln, so I'll take them out and I'll look at them. And I'll say, oh, here's what that did. Um, or I'll just do that one, the one day, like if I'm working on like a turkey face, and I want to make turkey face the next 12 times I'm sitting on a torch, and by the 12th one, I want it to be very face-like. So the first one is just like a shape, and then I'm like, over the next three days, I'm like saying, fixing my beak, and then I start like fixing the eyes, and then I like start fixing the feathers, and so I have all these improvements going on a different ways as that marble progresses. But that's dumb, don't do that. That's my stupid thing. All right, so I started to cup and push this and shrink it down. I'm gonna add some petioles, some green petals on the outside of this, now that I've started to shrink it. And when I, when I shrink it, I hold it down at an angle like this so the edges melt and it starts to fold and that's cupping and then I push it flat again. Each time you do that you're taking the glass from the outside and letting it come around and flat it. And push it. So sort of inside out. Like one convective cell motion. Turn down my heat, and I'm going to add my next layer of little green petioles around the flower. I've already shrunk a little bit, and we'll see what that looks like. So there is the middle, the orange slugs are the yellow petals, and then around the outside, the little thin green ones are the petioles. So now let's heat that whole thing up, and we're going to cup and push it so it's going to slump down flat. We'll do that a couple times. And then from there we'll build the background of the marble. But we'll watch this flower bloom up this way into the disc over the next couple 
heats and how the shaping is. Let's go slow. Then, you know, it starts to happen. It starts to happen, baby. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. <laughs> Cool though, you can go too slow and not get get the motion going. You do too fast and everything uh, gets smushed and unrecognizable. So you gotta find that middle. Oh, that's where I was getting earlier. You'll find your rate um, and how you want things to be shaped depending on the speed your glass is moving, the speed you're working on glass, the heat of your torch. Etc. So, let me push it again. You can see from the side that it's starting to come up into the disc. There's several other egg designs that I want to do other than this flower. I won't have time to do those in the demo, but there's like the enamel design that I do, where it's uh, enamel powder, which gives a very soft look. Almost like when you melt enamel powder onto a surface, it looks like the rough surface of an eggshell or the dusty rough surface of a flower petal, which I just think is great. Uh, so many glass, when you go just from one color to another color, the line is very hard. It's, it's a good look. It looks like classic glass. I like it. I, I, I use that for some of my stuff. But when it comes to flowers and some of the softer looking designs, I really like that enamel. And also that semi-mixed or like 75% mixed color look is nice. You can find that too. And that really depends on where you're getting your glass, your, your basic colors. Because some of it comes very homogenized, and other stuff, uh, the mix is very rough. They're leaving it up to you to finish up or use the way it is. Um, there's a few brands out now that do leave it very, um, the, the mix is loose. And some of those brands I like for that, um, but their glass is much easier to use in smaller volumes. When you start working up to marbles, it's super shocky and annoying for me. You might like it. If I get glass that's, sh that, that's what I would consider unstable temperature-wise, um, sometimes it does benefit from mixing some sort of uh, homogenizing with other glass. And then that depends on your brand, what chemicals they use for uh, opaquing agents, uh, that sort of stuff. Shit, I guess I could go on and on. I'll stop that. That's it. Too much. Let's just make a flower. <laughs> And then we'll make it into an egg. Start spewing numbers will be shooting out of my face. <laughs> well, hey, look at this. You can see our flower. Oh, that's too high. See our flower blooming. See it in the It's nice like that. Cool to be able to see that, but it does slow things down to a stop. Um, so I need to get heat back up to resume the cup and push process. But if you ever do have your shape turning inside out, your twist, whatever, it's moving too fast. Part of it's moving too fast and the other part's not moving too fast, just wait. Three seconds, five seconds, temperature will start to equalize. Whatever's too fast will slow down. 
it takes longer to go up in temperature. Um, but once the temperature is way up, so easy to make mistakes and go too far too fast and ruin what you've done. I know a lot of times I'll be look, watching other people work and I'll be like, come on, put your foot on the gas. <laughs> but that's either, like I'm impatient because I've seen that a lot or I know that's where I go faster. It's just fun. Going slow and even is important for certain types of work and other types of work you can go fast. All depends on what you're doing. This flower is really blooming out nice now. Just about ready to put a background on it. What we'll do is we'll put like stuff, out of focus stuff in the distance. Other flowers are the same color. I've got a yellow and pink string that I've pulled that I've been using for some of this uh, distance type suggestions of other flowers in the distance. Let's see, someone asked about colors that require striking and um, that is I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> no, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things to be said about different colors striking in certain ways, uh, where you have to get it up to a certain temperature and then let it come down. But then, if you get it back up to that temperature again, you're going to deactivate the color, so you've ruined your strike. So generally, if you're working striking, I guess the answer to the question is, is you go slower. Um, just before you're done, it's sort of like um, you try to hit that striking temperature and then get out. Or, or have the striking glass protected under a layer of something else, usually clear. So if I'm like making a flower, sometimes I'll use a striking transparent color on the stringer and so I'll make a stringer that's like a white base and put striking yellow or pink or orange over the white and pull it out into a thread like this but I won't strike it I'll just strike it on the back end so I know I can go and say oh is that the pink one yeah that's the one and it'll, otherwise it'll just look more like it's white and then when I'm doing my colors for my flower, I'll make the flower. And then um, as it's as I'm doing like the inside out and the last part of the design, um, it gets struck. And then um, you're not looking at the flower and it's like encased and it's clear. So then it's a little bit safer. You'd have to really um, get it going very hot to ruin the strike then. But different glass, different companies have different feels for their striking glass. And I guess the terminology for striking, um, I've heard some people refer to their striking as doing an oxidation or reduction striking, which I don't have a lot of experience with, um, but you may have heard that, something to be aware of. And that is, this soft glass and hard glass that that does that. You know, that's a... Okay, I put a bunch of... <laughs> Sidetrack. <coughs> I finished doing my cup and push inside out. So the flower has bloomed. I started doing the little dots of the yellow and pink, which are going to be the flowers. Now I'm going to do the background color that's going to face up into the flower. Then I'm going to do the background color that faces out into the world. So let's do a dark blue, because you'd never see that in real life, but I think it looks amazing. <laughs> so let's do it. A little cool. So I don't know if that answered anyone's question about the striking glass or raised more questions. 
but I lost my train of thought. There, so. All right, so that flat area, I cover that little dot in the middle. That's where all of the flower petals and the petioles are together. Got a little dot put on there. Heat it so it comes off. And keep that glass hot. Squish it flat so it covers over all that other work. Those little dots that I just did. Probably won't be able to see that. Maybe a little bit. Oh yeah. yeah. This is the flower, the background, the little flowers in the background. Little background. I'll spread out a little bit more. When I put my outside color on, I'm going to use light blue. And it's looking pretty nice. It's air flower blooming. I'd be interested to see how those stamen look. It was a brown and dark purple twist, and two of the stamen I poked up like I poke a petal, so they'd stand up a little taller than the others. And if you look at a flower, a lot of times you see, not always, that might be like five stamen, but only two of them are standing up and uh, having the pollen on the end. So that's kind of a fun observation if you're looking at flowers and trying to reproduce them. So I'm going to put that light blue on, switch that flat. And that's how it looks. Two discs of color. Now let's melt those in. Ideally I want to melt that in so that the dark blue forms a border. And the light blue. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> you like cheating. Border around there. Uh. <laughs> Make it look cool. Do it in the most lazy way possible. <laughs> and never tell anyone how you did it. Oh! <laughs> Two colors are melting together. I'm going to give it a little bit of persuasion into a sphericalness. A little persuasion. Small. Got a, something on my thumb preventing me from spinning the glass. Got to take off. If you've watched my demos, you know I always have band-aids on my fingers. Just the way of things. Alright, now it's getting spherical down there. Give it one more little bump to the realm of the spherical. Then I'm going to decorate that blue, light blue field that we created. There's the light blue field. Let's see, yellow. And I think I have a little more looser yellow and purple. Dot put in there. And let's turn this down. I'm just going to do a loose array of twisted dot circles. Giving them a little. As I go in, I'll show you when I'm done. All right. 
those dots on there. Let's see there. Suggestive of floral with a mix of yellow and purple. Let's mount them in. I'll let them pull in with surface tension a little bit. Then I'll push them into the surface a little bit and repeat. I want them to go in, but I don't want them to spread out. And I want the detail to stay sharp. So getting them hot and then pushing them in has a nice, uh, a nice way to sort of freeze the detail, push it in. So you can see it's still up. Now I'm going to just push it in a little bit. I didn't quite get, get it as far as I wanted. That looks pretty good. If you heat them too much, they'll start to get, the detail will get fuzzy, which also is a nice look. If you like that, you make change your mind, go back and forth. See what happens. Decide you like it, you don't like it. Do it the other way. And then uh, next week, discover that you hate everything you did the week previous and you destroy it all and start all over. Mm -hmm. That happens. <laughs>
All right, we're ready to. It's, it's ripply because this is flower is pretty deep because I poked those petals up. Let's switch off. I want this to be the egg axis I want to be down through here. So let's switch off to a different axis. I do this a lot, um, switching to the axis. Um, I haven't really seen other people mess with this too much. Um, first time I think I saw it was uh, Marble Makers doing it. Uh, some of the old guys that aren't around anymore that were very technical in particular. Uh, Drew Fritz and Mike Edmondson. Very lamp work focused, very detail oriented guys. All right, so now I'm heating up that flower. I'm going to start shaping it by using a larger mold using the actual side of the mold to start shaping this into a egg shape. So I've taken my sphere shape, starting to ruin it. But, or am I making it awesomely egg shaped? Yes. Anyway, I always was fascinated by changing the axis. Because, like, you know, you look at glass blowing and stuff, and you see a lot of the same designs being enacted over hundreds of years, same way. Because they're they're doing stuff off the end of the pipe, and twisting and pulling and stuff like that, but they're not removing it and starting over on a whole new axis. And I think that is like some very interesting territory. If you're doing like a bead, um, that's where it's a great place to start doing torch work. Uh, you can feel the glass, you know, start small, work, work way bigger. But you're kind of trapped on the axis. But the amazing things that people have been doing with just that one axis that they're stuck on is just amazing. You could look at it all day and not get bored with what you're seeing. All right. So, after a couple passes, we've made it egg-shaped. Whoa! That's a good one. Whee! So there's the bottom. I decorate. There's the top. Let's see the flower. Let's smooth it up. And now I can't use like a cherry wood mold on this one. Uh, because I don't have any cherry wood molds the right shape. Um, I'm making one the size for this. I'm dubious as to whether that would be successful or not. So what I'm going to do is just let it slump through gravity and that surface tension, clear out my ripples, and then I'm just going to keep it spinning. And I'm going to show you as soon as it firms up. That's got smooth, smooth and egg shaped. Let's give it a nice one. That beautiful little yellow corner. Now the end where I'm still attached is not very smooth yet. So what I'm going to do is now that this end is firming up. I'm going to get a little glass rod 
get it clean. Pull out that, that little end of whatever weird's going on on the end. Shape it to a pencil point. Oops. Yeah. Now I'm gonna get a something a little smushier than a cold joint on there. I missed my axis a little bit. So I'll get another go at it. I missed it in the same place again. It's off by just a little bit. It'll be alright. So now I'm going to heat this metal handle punky until it gets hot enough to pull out of the glass. Like this. I can really heat up that end to see if there's anything left in there. That'll glow orange and you piece of it. And I saw a little tiny one. And I'm gonna heat that. There's a little bump up, so I'm just gonna push it in. Like that off. Now I'm gonna let surface tension and heat and rotation pull that egg into a more rounded shape on the end. I'm going to go kind of slow. Every once in a while, I'm evening the heat up on my whole egg. The egg shape is going to cool faster than my sphere. So I'm going to pay a little more attention to that pointy end over here. Not a lot. I wouldn't mind. All right. See those two stamen in the middle poking up? <laughs> Did it. All right. Now I have my fiberboard plate. What's in it? I set my egg in there, and I'm going to chill that last connection point with these scissors, barber scissors. My high technical glass jacks. Pick up my torch. Tap any dust off there. Flame polish that last connection point. So the egg is smooth all the way around. No little rough spots. Then, using my marble pliers, I'm just going to heat these up until they're just orange. Let them chill to black. These are about the right temperature. Okay. So, I'll let those chill back to black. Then I can pick up my glass without shocking it, without sticking to it. There's my egg, flour egg. I'm going to go put it in the annealing oven. Be right back. All right, that's just a little tiny egg. So that'll anneal for an hour at about 960 to 980 degrees Fahrenheit. Then I'll turn the temperature down over a period of a few hours. Actually, um, since that's on a rheostat, I'll turn it down after about an hour. I'll turn it down after about every, two more times in every half hour after that. Um, the temperature insulation of it is pretty good. So it's gonna drop slowly enough. That will be fun. And I will post pictures of that one tomorrow, along with a bunch of other uh, flower eggs that I've been working on. And we'll look at them side by side and see what it looks like. And uh, thanks for watching. See you guys next week. We'll probably make another uh, egg, like a galaxy egg or an eye egg. <coughs> um, unless I'm sick of eggs by then. I don't know. We've got a lot going on at the studio. It's springtime. All kinds of crap's happening. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> See you guys later.